and welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another jam-packed, action-filled information overload on this 7th of March, 2019. March is finally here. It's supposed to mean warm weather, right? Right? Uh, I know back in the fall that I had put on one of the Bist uh, Joe Bastardi's uh, Saturday summaries or daily updates. I think it was the Saturday summary where he said that we're coming into a Mendoki El Nino season and that uh, he had given some analogs on the years that uh, this was, he believed was going to pattern. And so then I looked it up and we should have only gotten 35.5 inches of snow the entire season. And then about two to three weeks ago, Joe Bastardi came out and said, there was something going on that he didn't see. He apologized to those of us in the plains in the upper Midwest for getting hammered with snow and cold. He did apologize. I'm not going to play the apology only because it's in part of like a 10 minute video. Uh, but he did admit that what he, that there's something and he still, uh, as of uh, the other day, he still hadn't figured out what it was from his methodology that he didn't get. There, there's something that was missing in his analysis. Uh, he did say that the El Nino uh, that's come on was a little bit late and pushed a little further east, which is pretty consistent with, with what he had said last fall. And uh, I have no video. And we seem to be back. Okay, so I guess, you know, that, that was just, you know, more El Nino uh, winter mistakes that just happened to have hit our video feed. Anyhow, uh, Bastardi came out and he said that he didn't expect the El Nino to come on as late as it did and go as far east as it did. Well, that came right over us. So we're now going to show Bastardi, and I do still trust him, and I, I especially trust him when he admits that he made a mistake, and he makes an apology, whereas I know a lot of politicians who don't. Uh, but Bastardi, in today's daily update, pretty much has given us what we can s expect to see for the rest of the month. And let's take a look at what he had to say. Weather Bell Analytics, meteorologist Joe Bastardi. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is March, uh, April, May 2011. This is like a benchmark tornado season. And I'm showing you this because the mean pattern of higher than normal tornadic activity is cold in the north and west, warm in the south and east, and we got that coming up. Uh, we have two what I consider major outbreaks on the way. One is coming uh, on, on the weekend in the, this part of the United States, and there will be another one next week. And so what happens is the mean temperatures, uh, day 2.5 or whatever, that five-day period that both of these are going to occur, are right in line with what we look for. So we have all the signals pointed at this. And I'll tell you, I, I think this is going to be a bigger area. It's a slight risk here on day three. My opinion is this, this, is, this is going to be a big ticket item here, lower Mississippi Valley. Or, I don't know, Delta. This is the Delta. I keep getting the lower Mississippi Valley up into the Ohio Valley, okay? And then it weakens day four. But if you look at the upper pattern that causes that, here comes the trough lifting out of the southwest. So what happens is you get low-level southerly winds come up. You get a mid-level surge of dry air over the top. And it creates that uh, crucial shearing intersection that we look for for these things. So that's coming on the weekend. And then there's another one. And it may be a bigger one that lifts up next week. So we got two of them coming in a row, all right? Then after that, the trough is shifting into the east and we'll shut this down, okay? So this is uh, the March 2014 benchmark cold in the United States, the first week. This is what we look look like so far. Now, you see this, this deep purple area here. If we were to be using this, it would start with a, because a different color scheme, it would start here. So uh, comparably cold uh, to that month. And the rest of the month, according to the climate model, looks like this. So this March is going to rival 2014. Now, 14, 13, and 96 were the coldest ones since the late 70s. So this is the late 70s. A couple of them just 
crazy, all right? So I'm not going to... Uh, 1978, March of 78 was vicious. March of 1960, I can't even comprehend that happening again. <laughs> so, I mean, it was, it, was, it was like in its own world uh, the first couple of weeks of March. So, but this is, this is majorly cold. And uh, anyway, I'll uh, show you what these temperatures look like. Day one through five, like this. So the cold is beginning to retreat. There's your six to 10. And then it comes back in the 11 to 15, 15 to 20. Now that's spring, calendar spring, but it's going to feel still more like winter. So this isn't over. Part of the reason is now the Southern Oscillation Index is now kicking into El Nino category, so you're getting the El Nino response. Even though the, uh, even though the sea surface temperatures warmed in the uh, winter right on time, the response in the atmosphere was a little bit later. But now that it's occurring, you're seeing these cold pushes uh, get further east than what they did in the heart of winter. And uh, I'll tell you, the last couple of weeks of March will be pretty darn wild across the United States. Winter weather wild. All right, there'll be a lot of snow and a lot of cold. That's it for now. Enjoy the weather. It's the only weather you got. So that's what we can look forward to is more cold. Now keep in mind, cold, when he talks about cold, it's colder than normal. Now as we are into March with more daylight and more uh, sun impacting the atmosphere, the temperatures do get warmer. They're just not going to get as warm, warm as we have seen in the past. Now, I have looked at some of the models that, uh, that show that by April we should be in the 40s and 50s, and actually we have about three weeks of 70s that may be coming up in the uh, first week of May. Subject to revision, of course. So don't actually pin me down and say, you promised, if it doesn't happen that way. I'm only going according to what the models suggest on a 12-week uh, forecast. And no, I don't have meteorological training. I just listen to Bastardi, and then I look at what the models say, and then I tell you what they say. And, you know, sometimes I find that this is even more accurate than what you see with a lot of people on 4, 5, 9, and 11. So take it for what it's worth. I mean, it's, it's free TV. But anyhow, uh, since we are uh, t showing you about the weather, now let's talk about the climate. Now, I find it funny how I get a lot of people who support climate change who then, when we had the polar vortex and it was 23 below zero outside, and you point out the fact that the windmills aren't working and that we're not going into a heating pattern, then they all say, well, well this is just one data point, and, and, and you, you really can't make any extrapolations based upon the temperature, but in the middle of summer, if it happens to be above normal temperatures, they're going to be the first ones out there proclaiming that it's climate change and global warming. So, is climate change really our biggest problem? Well, that's our Prager University segment of today. Let's find out. One of the most persistent claims in the climate debate is that global warming leads to more extreme weather. This is a common concern expressed by those who fear a dangerously warming planet. President Barack Obama did so eloquently in his 2013 State of the Union address when he talked about the devastating impact of raging fires and crippling drought and more powerful storms. Many others have offered similar sentiments. Global warming is a problem that needs to be addressed, but exaggeration doesn't help and often distracts us from simple, cheaper, and smarter solutions. To find those solutions, let's address the three horsemen of the climate apocalypse to which President Obama referred. Historical analysis of wildfires around the world shows that since 1950, their numbers have decreased globally by 15%. Estimates published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences shows that even with global warming, the level of wildfires will continue to decline until mid-century and won't resume on the level of 1950, the worst for fire, before the end of the century. Claiming that droughts are a consequence of global warming is also wrong. The world has not seen a general increase in drought. A study published in Nature in March 2014 shows globally that there's been little change in drought over the past 60 years. The UN Climate Panel in 2012 concluded, some regions of the world have experienced more intense and longer droughts, in particular in Southern Europe and West Africa, 
but in some regions, droughts have become less frequent, less intense, or shorter, for example in central North America and northwestern Australia. And finally, the third horseman, hurricanes. Global hurricane activity today, measured by total energy, hasn't been lower since the 1970s. While it's likely that we will see somewhat stronger, but fewer, storms as climate change continues, damages will be lower because we'll be better adapted. A March 2012 Nature study shows that the global damage cost from hurricanes will be 0.02% of gross domestic product by 2100, down 50% from today's 0.04%. Let me make this clear. This does not mean that climate change isn't an issue. It means that exaggerating the threat concentrates resources in the wrong areas. Consider hurricanes, though similar points hold for wildfire and drought. If the aim is to reduce storm damage, then first focus on resilience, better building codes, and better enforcement of those codes. Ending subsidies for hurricane insurance to discourage building in vulnerable zones would also help, as would investing in better infrastructure, from stronger levees to higher capacity sewers. These solutions are quick and comparatively cheap. Most important, they would diminish future hurricane damage, whether climate-induced or not. Had New York and New Jersey focused resources on building seawalls and adding storm doors to the subway system and making simple fixes like porous pavements, Hurricane Sandy would have caused much less damage. In the long run, the world needs to cut carbon dioxide because it causes global warming. But if the main effort to cut emissions is through subsidies for chic renewables like wind and solar power, virtually no good will be achieved at very high cost. The cost of climate policies just for the European Union intended to reduce emissions by 2020 to 20% 20 below 1990 levels are estimated at about $250 billion annually, or about $20 trillion over the century. And the benefits, when estimated using a standard climate model, will reduce temperatures only by an immeasurable one-tenth of a degree Fahrenheit by the end of the century. Even in 2040, under its most optimistic scenario, the International Energy Agency estimates that just 2.2% of the world's energy will come from wind and solar. As is the case today, almost 80% will still come from fossil fuels. As long as green energy is more expensive than fossil fuels, growing consumer markets like those in China and India will continue mostly to be powered by them. Solar, wind, and other renewables are still inefficient because they require subsidies of more than $120 billion a year. And even in 2040, they won't be efficient. The International Energy Agency estimates they will still require more than $200 billion annually. Instead of pouring money into subsidies for existing inefficient wind and solar energy, we'd be far better off supporting research and development of green energy technologies to make them cheaper, faster. When innovation eventually makes green energy as cheap or cheaper than fossil fuel energy, everyone will use it, including China and India. Until then, let's cool the fear-mongering and make practical decisions that will help people now. I'm Bjorn Lomborg, president of the Copenhagen Consensus Center. And see, that is exactly the right attitude. Help people now. Now we can still take a look at the longer term implications, but we cannot do this at the expense of progress. I bring that up because we already have a solution being proposed in Congress to fight climate change. Yes, that's what it's designed for. And the funny thing is, um, this story comes from Al Jazeera. They actually have some of the most balanced coverage on this particular issue. And yes, I am talking about the Green New Deal, pushed by freshman representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, AOC as uh, she's known by. And the Democrats are pushing for a Green New Deal. I don't know why they would want to push for a Green New Deal when the original New Deal from FDR didn't work. It escapes me. 
anyhow, that's just the historian in me coming out. Um, if you look at the actual New Deal, it kept us in depression five years longer than what we should have been in. So by about 1935, we should have been on the road to recovery. But FDR kept us in longer. And I guess I'll preface that because the uh, Green New Deal will keep us in much longer in the long run. So let's take a look at Al Jazeera's coverage of the Green New Deal. Uh, Speaker Pelosi and I have, have spoken at... The Green New Deal has been a priority for progressive left-wing Democrats elected last November. It's based on the principle that a system that's produced unprecedented inequality is also hastening global environmental catastrophe. I don't think that we lose elections by addressing climate change. And what I sense, at least in, in some portions of the country, is that people grow frustrated because they don't feel like we're being ambitious enough. The key goals of the Green New Deal are to meet all of the U.S.'s power demands through renewable zero-emission energy during a 10-year national mobilization, while ensuring communities and workers don't suffer during the transition. The need for action has been echoed by a Republican leadership that usually expresses little appetite for debate on the environment or economic inequality. I've noted with great interest the Green New Deal, and we're going to be voting on that in the Senate. We'll give everybody an opportunity to go on record. The Republicans see an opportunity in the deal's emphasis on reducing greenhouse gases while creating an equitable society, but an opportunity to fracture the Democratic Party and not to save the planet. The era of big government is over. Bill Clinton shifted the Democrats from left to right, away from the social safety net to the primacy of market forces and big business. Now, almost 30 years later, the left is fighting back, and the Democratic leadership fears the Republicans will present them as socialist extremists, even as opinion polls show broad support for higher taxes on the rich to fund government spending on education, health care, and averting climate change. House Majority Leader Nancy Pelosi's dismissive comments when asked what she thought about the Green New Deal were revealing. The Green Dream, or whatever they call it, she replied. Nobody knows what it is, but they're all for it, right? It's the grassroots calling for action on climate change and economic equality. The Sunrise Movement is a nationwide group of young people that's helped place the Green New Deal on the political agenda. It says the leadership of both parties have a lot to lose if they underestimate support for the Green New Deal and the electorate's frustration for how things are. I think this is a crucial juncture for leadership. For a long time, we've seen the Democrats say that they believe the science but fail to take decisive action. What Mitch McConnell doesn't seem to understand is that he doesn't even have the support of his own voting base. 64% of Republicans support what's laid out in the Green New Deal resolution. McConnell's glee at the prospect of presenting the Democrats as too divided even to challenge an unpopular president may be well-founded then if the Democratic leadership continues to resist policies that may lead to the change voters say they actually want. Shia Britansi, Al Jazeera, Washington. This week, Representative... Let's get one thing straight. The uh, student who came up with the 64% of Republicans support the Green New Deal? Uh, no, they don't. I, I can assure you of that. The polling data that I've seen uh, suggests that it's a much, much, much lower percentage. Maybe 64% might oppose the Green New Deal, although I think the number is probably more like 90% of Republicans oppose the Green New Deal. Uh, certainly, 64% of Republicans supporting it, no, that's not the case. Um, but the Democrats are going to push this. Now, we're going to take a look at a reaction. It's not so much a reaction. This is a, uh, from Bloomberg. Uh, this is their BNEF brief. And really, the guy on here is not objective at all. He gives a subjective account, almost mourning the fact that it's probably not going to get passed. But let's take a look at what he has to say in his analysis. This week, Representative Ocasio-Cortez unveiled a Green New Deal to reset climate policy. Joining me now is Stephen Monroe from Bloomberg NEF. Stephen, what did she propose? Alex, she proposed a mobilization, a 10-year mobilization of the U.S. economy to uh, get to uh, net zero carbon emissions. And in addition, she is uh, inserting some uh, labor-related standards that would uh, that would weigh heavily or significantly on the economy. Is anything in what she proposed realistic or lines up with what uh, Bloomberg NEF has been looking at? 
Well, from a technological point of view, uh, the uh, carbon neutrality is a realistic goal within 10 years, uh, given the constraints of capital and land availability. I think the, uh, the biggest obstacles to be faced are on the political side. Yeah, what is the support in Washington for something like this? Well, the, the support at this point falls right on, on party lines. Democrats, uh, about 60 House Democrats have signed up um, and no Republicans. Um, there's about 235 Democrats in the House, so we, you know, we're, we're working towards a majority uh, support from there. But really, in order for this resolution to go forward, we'd, we'd need to have a 180 degree uh, reversal, of course, by President Trump and, the, and congressional Republicans. Who, so uh, so definitely looks, looks unlikely, obviously, but it does set the conversation forward. Is this a sort of de facto ban on fossil fuels at the end of the day? It's not explicitly a de facto ban. It, it calls for carbon neutrality, uh, which would allow uh, fossil fuels such as coal uh, and natural gas to continue to be used as long as the carbon emissions were captured and stored. Climate change in our Okay, I know he was a little abrupt there. Uh, he's got some merit to his argument. Some of it, I, I think he's a little too much of a cheerleader and not enough of an analyst. Uh, I think there's some wishful thinking, but um, we, uh, hold on a minute here. We're just going to go right into the next clip because my phone's going off and it, it's freaking me out. Climate change and our environmental challenges are the, one of the biggest existential threats to our way of life. We must be as ambitious and innovative in our solution as possible. The Democrats are right. The climate crisis needs a bold response. But their Green New Deal is not it. Here's our plan. Polluters must pay a lot for their emissions. Big companies would have to change. We should start with carbon pricing, which is not even in the Green New Deal. The government should mandate that companies make more efficient refrigerators, cars, and buildings. It should invest more in effective public transportation and clean energy research. Democrats should focus on that, not waste money on unrealistic solutions like massive new high-speed rail. Climate change is a huge problem. Humanity does not have the luxury of ignoring the smartest solutions. Okay, so they are correct and incorrect in that, in that assessment. I, I'm not gonna worry about Stephen Monroe's comments. Um, they are uh, uh, correct about unrealistic solutions. High-speed rail, that is an unrealistic solution. I'm going to give them credit for that. However, the problem I have is government should mandate. That's what the entire Green New Deal is, folks. Government should mandate. In other words, you don't know what's best for you. You don't know that the kind of car that you want to buy at a car lot is best for you. you Government is going to be the one to tell the automakers of what you want. That's what it is. Your refrigerator. You have a refrigerator that just because you may be low income, you have a refrigerator that was built in 1979 that it's a little leaky, the motor's kind of uh, a little loud, freaking the cats out. Um, if it gets warm in the summer, you got to continually defrost it. You're ready to get a new refrigerator. You kind of want something that's going to be beneficial for you. Why do you have to have the government coming in and telling the manufacturers what kind of refrigerator that you need to have that's going to cost you three to four hundred dollars more on a baseline unit? So instead of a, a cheap refrigerator costing four hundred and fifty bucks. You now got to pay $1,000 just because the government is going to tell you that it doesn't want a certain type of condensing unit because it's going to combat climate change. That's how the Green New Deal and government mandates affect you. It affects your pocketbook. And this doesn't matter if you're a Democrat, a Republican, an independent, a Green Party person, socialist worker, legal marijuana now. It doesn't matter. Libertarian. Constitutional Party, whatever political party you belong to, it does not matter. What matters is you're still a consumer in this country, and you're going to be getting ripped off. You are. I'm not going to mince words. You're going to get ripped off. 
If the Green New Deal comes in, you're going to have a whole list of government mandates. Can you find an incandescent light bulb anymore? No. Why? Because Congress decided that we're going to ban incandescent light bulbs. We still don't have them back. As a matter of fact, I was at the Maplewood Mall last night. Uh, I had to run in to Barnes & Noble to look for a book on the Human Genome Project. And I was sitting there in the, in, in the parking lot, and it was about 7, 8 o'clock at night. And I'm thinking, my, is this really ever dark around here? And I looked up at the streetlights, and they were all using LED lighting. And the LEDs weren't as bright as the sodium-based uh, lights that they had replaced. Furthermore, the lighting right on the side, uh, at the entrance to the mall was no longer there. I don't, I, don't, I don't even know if the light fixtures are in place or not. So the entire front of the mall was all dark. The only type of light you saw was the sign from Barnes & Noble and some of the light emanating through the windows. But that's your Green New Deal, folks. Oh, it's dark. Get used to it. Toughen up. That's your Green New Deal. Because it's going to be too much of an energy drain if we actually install lighting so you can actually see as you're walking into a mall. Now, it's not government's fault if you slip on the ice because they took the light out and you didn't see it. But, of course, you know, with uh, the Affordable Care Act, well, the government's going to be paying for that anyway, uh, for any damages. And so, therefore, you know, we're all going to be wards of the state. That's how things like the Green New Deal impact us. Uh, the climate crisis, I really didn't even know that the climate was in crisis as much as these people tell me it is. Um, I don't recall the earth ever telling me that it was sick. Has the earth told you that it was sick? I mean, I keep hearing we want to save the earth. I keep asking from what? What does the earth need saving from? Now, I'm leading up to something, of course. So I'm a little bit of, a little facetious with some of my remarks here, but I am serious also in, in a similar vein. Uh, we're going to actually take a look at uh, a, a small clip of President Trump with his uh, discussion at the uh, CPAC conference last weekend on the Green New Deal. Thank you. Let us know on Sunday night. I got to be very careful when I talk about this. But it was the great tariff debate of 1888. And the debate was we didn't know what to do with all the money we were making. We were so rich. And McKinley, prior to being president, he was very strong on protecting our assets, protecting our country. And he made statements that others cannot come into our country and steal our wealth and steal our jobs and build their country and not defend our country. We can't do that. We can't ever allow that to happen. And you know, I don't know, maybe you know. You know, I'm totally off script, right? Thank you, darling. You know I'm totally off script right now. And this is how I got elected, by being off script. And if we don't go off script, our country's in big trouble, folks, because we have to get it back. And when I look at what's happening on the other side, I encourage it. I say, no, no, I, I think the new Green Deal, or whatever the hell they call it,
The Green New Deal, right? Green New Deal. I encourage it. I think, the, I think it's really something that they should promote. They should work hard on. It's something our country needs. Desperately, they have to go out and get it. But I'll take the other side of that argument only because I'm mandated to. I meant it, but they should stay with that argument. Never change. Never change. No planes. No energy. When the wind stops blowing, that's the end of your electric. Let's hurry up. <laughs> darling, darling, is the wind blowing today? I'd like to watch television, darling. Well, uh, I guess you can't say that uh, President Trump doesn't have a sense of humor, but he actually does, a, uh, does make a valid point with the wind. You know, is the wind blowing today, darling? I'd like to watch television. I uh, hope he's watching North Star Oasis um, so we can talk about the weather. <laughs> Uh, anyhow, uh, we're going to actually throw another Prager University segment your way because we're going to actually take a look a little bit more now about energy and uh, you know President Trump's comment about you know the wind blowing. Can we rely on wind and solar energy? Serious question. So here's uh, what we have to say with Prager University. Are wind and solar power the answer to our energy needs? There's a lot of sun and a lot of wind. They're free. They're clean no CO2 emissions. So what's the problem? Why do solar and wind combined provide less than 2% of the world's energy? To answer these questions, we need to understand what makes energy, or anything else for that matter, cheap and plentiful. For something to be cheap and plentiful, every part of the process to produce it, including every input that goes into it, must be cheap and plentiful. Yes, the sun is free. Yes, wind is free. But the process of turning sunlight and wind into usable energy on a mass scale is far from free. In fact, compared to the other sources of energy, fossil fuels, nuclear power, and hydroelectric power, solar and wind power are very expensive. The basic problem is that sunlight and wind as energy sources are both weak, the more technical term is dilute, and unreliable, the more technical term is intermittent. It takes a lot of resources to collect and concentrate them, and even more resources to make them available on demand. These are called the diluteness problem and the intermittency problem. The diluteness problem is that, unlike coal or oil, the sun and the wind don't deliver concentrated energy, which means you need a lot of additional materials to produce a unit of energy. For solar power, such materials can include highly purified silicon, phosphorus, boron, and a dozen other complex compounds like titanium dioxide. All these materials have to be mined, refined, and or manufactured in order to make solar panels. Those industrial processes take a lot of energy. For wind, needed materials include high-performance compounds for turbine blades and the rare earth metal neodymium for lightweight specialty magnets, as well as the steel and concrete necessary to build structures, thousands of them as tall as skyscrapers. And as big a problem as diluteness is, it's nothing compared to the intermittency problem. This isn't exactly a newsflash, but the sun doesn't shine all the time. And the wind doesn't blow all the time. The only way for solar and wind to be truly useful would be if we could store them so that they would be available when we needed them. You can store oil in a tank. Where do you store solar or wind energy? No such mass storage system exists which is why in the entire world, there is not one real or proposed independent freestanding solar or wind power plant. All of them require backup. And guess what the go-to backup is? Fossil fuel. Here's what solar and wind electricity look like in Germany, which is the world's leader in renewables. The word erratic leaps to mind. Wind is constantly varying, sometimes disappearing completely. And solar produces little in the winter months when Germany most needs energy. Therefore, some reliable source of energy is needed to do the heavy lifting. 
In Germany's case, that energy is coal. So, while Germany has spent tens of billions of dollars to subsidize solar panels and windmills, fossil fuel use in that nation has not decreased. It's increased, and less than 10% of their total energy is generated by solar and wind. Furthermore, switching back and forth between solar and wind and coal to maintain a steady flow of energy is costly. Utility bills for the average German have gone up so dramatically that energy poverty has become a popular term to describe those who cannot pay, or who can barely pay, their electricity bills. If those bills one day go down, the reason will not be more solar and wind energy, but lower oil and coal prices. There's no free lunch, and there's no free energy. And that very much includes the highly expensive energy from the sun and the wind. I'm Alex Epstein of the Center for Industrial Progress for Prager University. So there you have it. Green New Deal is just going to cost you more. Hope Congress doesn't pass it now or a long time into the future. Um, there are other things that can be done, and he even said we can make investment, private investment, into making more efficient systems. Can we create a battery that would allow solar and wind electricity to be stored to be used during peak periods? That's where we should be working on, on technology. That's where the R&D should be. It isn't for some reason. I, I'm sure there probably is some R&D money out there, uh, but we don't necessarily need to have government R&D. Let the private sector do it. If the private sector sees that it's a problem or if the private sector sees that they can make money, it'll be done because that's the way the market operates. That's capitalism. You put the capitalism to fill a need. You know, the, put the capital to fill a need. That's, that's one of the defining things. Find a need and fill it. Uh, Actually, I heard that from Donald Trump back in the 80s. Find a need and fill it. Um, so now, let's look back in history now. I'm talking way back. Way back, actually, prehistory. Uh, you know, if we, if, is, the climate, is climate change even a problem? Well, let's take a look at a previous cycle where it actually was a problem. And I'm not talking about global warming. I'm talking about frigid polar vortex cooling of a glacier age. And I'm not talking about the animated cartoon of the of Ice Age, Ice Age Madagascar, uh, but I am going to give you the Ice Age a very short introduction. One, Earth isn't normally an icy planet. Uh, for much of its 4.6 billion year history, it's been pretty much ice free, uh, certainly without large scale glaciation. Two, my very short introduction is about the Quaternary Ice Age. And the Quaternary is the most recent period in Earth history which covers the last 2.5 million years and includes the present day. Three, the term Ice Age, or in German, die Eiszeit, it was first coined in the 1830s uh, by a botanist uh, and sometime poet Carl Friedrich Schimper. Now, the Quaternary Ice Age is characterized by great shifts in global climate from cold glacial periods to warmer interglacial periods like the present day. Four, about 25,000 years ago, uh, at a time we call the last glacial maximum, much of Canada and North America uh, was covered by an enormous ice sheet called the Laurentide Ice Sheet. Uh, it was at more than three kilometers thick at its greatest extent and it ex its southern margins extended down beyond New York and Boston and Chicago. Five, there have been about 50 glacial interglacial cycles during the course of the Quaternary Ice Age. And these involve profound changes in ecosystems with movements of plants and animals and also humans um, over the last 2.5 million years or so. And as a result of these major ecosystem reorganizations, there were many casualties, uh, extinctions of the mammoth and the woolly rhinoceros, for example. Six, one of the reasons why the study of the Quaternary Ice Age is so exciting and so important is the fossil record is so rich and so well preserved. In the permafrost of Siberia, for example, we can retrieve uh, full carcasses of mammoths and cave lions and woolly rhinos with good preservation of soft body parts such as brains and stomach contents. And we can even re retrieve uh, traces of ancient DNA. This is just not possible with uh, the fossils from earlier geological periods. Seven. Could we clone a mammoth? Well, strictly speaking, we can't bring back the mammoth because we would need a living cell to be able to clone it. However, we have um, 
reconstructed the genome of the woolly mammoth, so we know which genes are responsible for its long shaggy coat, for example, and its thick layers of fat. So it would be possible to genetically edit uh, a modern Asian elephant to make it mammoth-like. That might sound rather appealing, quite exciting, but there are many powerful ethical reasons why we shouldn't do that. Eight, I must say something about extinction and about the history of our own species. So the Ice Age is also our story. Around about 50,000 years ago, we have genetic evidence for three distinct human species in Europe and Siberia. But by the end of the last glacial period, we were down to just one. That was us, Homo sapiens. And we've become a globally distributed species across six continents. Nine, the Ice Age isn't just about ice. It's important to appreciate that we were dealing with global environmental changes. In the middle and the lower latitudes, for example, in tropical environments, many of the large deserts were much drier and much cooler during the glacial stages of the Quaternary. 10. Lastly, I must say something about just one of the very many reasons why the study of the Ice Age is so important. If we take long cores of ice from Antarctica and Greenland, we can measure the concentration of gases in the bubbles preserved in those ice cores. And that analysis tells us that the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is typically about 180 parts per million for a glacial period, for a cold period, whereas it's rather higher in an interglacial period like the present day, and it should be about 280 parts per million. The carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere today is more than 400 parts per million. It's now higher and rising more quickly than at any other time since we've had humans on the planet. Okay, first of all, as far as carbon dioxide, yes, it is a greenhouse gas, but as we've discussed on previous uh, episodes of this show, it may not necessarily be the climate uh, control knob. Uh, Water vapor, which is also a greenhouse gas, probably has more to do with, do with the thing, carbon dioxide. So the science is not settled on that, but I wanted to just make sure we get that out. What I wanted to show with the Ice Age, a very short introduction, is the fact that human populations have been resilient to climate change. And we're talking real climate change when the ice sheets move around and they come down and people move around. There's a migratory pattern. As a matter of fact, some of the uh, earliest people to make it into Australia came through a land bridge, through uh, Indonesia and, uh, you know, and, and, uh, from India through, I think, Vietnam. Kind of like looking at, a, at the board game of risk and seeing the little you know, way of moving your troops around. There, there was about... Um, the waters have, have risen about 100 feet, I believe, maybe 300 feet, in the last 15 to 20,000 years. So the uh, evidence of that migration is probably buried uh, somewhere underneath the ocean floor. That's climate change. The rising sea levels already happened. Now, are they going to happen again? <laughs> probably won't find out in my lifetime. Um, if you take a look at a lot of the uh, population of Europe, and we're going to get into this in another show. I'm just going to give you a little taste of it right now. Uh, when the ice sheets were uh, down through northern and central Europe, the population was around the Mediterranean. But as those ice sheets receded during the Ice Age, after uh, the glacier maximum, the population went north. We were a hunting-gathering society back then. Not like, because uh, the societies really go from hunter-gathering into agriculture, then into industry, and then here we have now a con uh, post-consumer society. Uh, but that's how, how we've migrated over thousands of years. We've gone from arcane techniques of hunter-gathering all the way up to you can watch me on TV. I mean, that's, that's how we've changed. So... The climate, we've been resilient in the past. We will be resilient again. Uh, nobody still knows exactly what the future is going to foretell. foretell. We, we don't. So this whole thing about Green New Deal and we need to fight climate change, I don't know what kind of climate that they want to change. Do we want to go back to an ice age or are we trying to prevent an ice age? Oh, we're trying to prevent burning up, but yet we have polar vortexes. See, as nothing ever is you know, settled. It's, ne it's never static. It's, it's a very elastic and dynamic process. That's why the weather is the weather. We go through periods of warming, we go through periods of cooling. So I don't know why we're even trying to fight that to begin with. 
But nonetheless, we're going to take a look at the one thing that we can do to reduce carbon emissions. If carbon emissions are even a threat, there is something that we can do. So we're going to take a look at American energy dominance and nuclear power regulation. American energy dominance. First, we will begin to revive and expand our nuclear energy sector, which produces clean, renewable, and emissions-free energy. NRC regulations specifically spell out prohibitions against fluid-filled reactors to more than one megawatt. A complete review of U.S. nuclear energy policy. A lot of energy consumption is largely industrial processes. Unbelievably optimized process. So besides your scrap material input, what's your next largest cost on production? Electricity. Electricity. This is a recycling facility. This is a sorting facility. Sorting is labor intensive. Recycling is energy intensive. Most people don't understand everything you look at, touch, feel, anything is tangible. There's energy behind it, a lot of it. Why nuclear energy? Why melting salt reactor? Why China is the first one to eat the crap? That's Chinese saying. And they are well-funded and well-staffed. It's very compelling work. The Chinese are definitely in the lead right now on this. China export is not for consume, it's for production. President Obama in his State of the Union address said, A new generation of safe, clean nuclear power plants in this country. And both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, stood up like he'd saluted the military. We're all at Oak Ridge. The morning that we showed up, one of the Oak Ridge guys came in with an announcement from the Chinese Academy of Science. We are going to do this. We're going to own the IP. So you would think our government would say, maybe you shouldn't keep giving away this information. The current system incentivizes reactor designers to develop their first projects outside of the United States. It's going to preclude us from certain countries until they come to their senses. We do feel that we have a competitive advantage by pursuing this technology in Canada. China is. India is. The Czech Republic bought FLOD for pennies on the dollar from Oak Ridge National Laboratories. We basically gave it away. There is no way for us to move beyond the laboratory scale work that we're currently doing. We want more than anything to do this in the U.S. How is it that China will deliver this system and not the U.S.? Okay, so that's kind of the setup here for our final segment of uh, today. Um, there, there are solutions out there, and a thorium-based reactor is actually one of them, and China is taking the lead, as you just saw there. We're going to take a look at a film trailer from a film. I have not watched the entire film, uh, but it came out, I think, in 2013, and it's called Pandora's Promise. So let's take a look at that trailer right now, because this is actually kind of enlightening uh, when you take a look at some of the statements from some of the uh, known environmentalists. Assuming that the world continues to develop, we can have 10 billion people living high energy, resource intensive lives. How much energy is the world going to use? I spend the entirety of my professional career working for the big environmental groups. To actually believe in nuclear power was by definition to be a dupe. The atomic radiation issue in Tokyo from the nuclear power plant I at Fukushima Daiichi. Two Mile Island, Chernobyl. We don't want a radioactive wasteland, whether it's from a bomb or a nuclear plant. The nuclear industry is a death industry. It's killing people and will for the rest of time. I avoided looking at the whole picture and only looked at the questions that seemed to prove that nuclear power was dangerous. The whole nuclear business was started for a bomb. And I think that put the negative side on it. I'm against nuclear, but what if what I've been thinking all this time is wrong? We accepted most of the basic ideas of the environmental movement. We're all going to start using renewables. Go solar. It really took us getting clear about how big the gap was between fossil fuels and renewables for us to take a second look at nuclear. Having children has made me even more concerned about tackling global warming. I had a sneaking suspicion that nuclear was going to have to be part of the solution. Most people kind of think we're going to be reducing our energy consumption. Actually, we just find more and more uses for it. This isn't just something you can brush away. 
have a world living modern lives without killing the climate. Loving your children is about loving the future and loving the world that they're going to inherit. Can you be an environmentalist and pro-nuclear? In light of climate change, can you be an environmentalist and not be pro-nuclear? So uh, it's interesting to see even environmentalists who have long since opposed nuclear energy starting to say maybe we ought to revisit that. That's actually a good thing because it is a very viable alternative. Now, we're going to take a look here in just a moment here for our, our last major segment, um, and that is the history of uh, thorium. Thorium is a... Uh, use in nuclear reactors. That is opposed to uh, uranium-based uh, reactors. And the one thing about th uh, thorium salts, um, the salt-based uh, used from thorium, is that you cannot make plutonium out of it. Plutonium is what creates nuclear weapons. So that alone is a plus. So are we ready? Okay. We're going to show you now uh, more of a history of thorium reactors some of the gentlemen who worked on this project long ago. Do you think building molten salt reactors in the future would be a good idea? Oh, heavens yes. Dick, what do you think? <laughs> I, I think it would be a very good idea. It would be tragic if we don't follow this and end up uh, buying another technology uh, from foreign powers in other parts of the world. China currently makes my squash rackets, and pretty soon they're going to be making my reactors if we don't uh, turn this around a little bit. China's developing this thing very rapidly with the help of our national labs, with the Department of Energy. They've publicly said they're going to control this. How is it that we created it here, the ultimate gift to humanity, and how is it that China will deliver this system and not the U.S.? It would be crazy for us to, to give up the technology that we developed back in the 1960s to, to another country. It might not seem like it, but it's the middle of the day here in Beijing. The air is so polluted that it's darkened the sky. But the thing is, speaking as an internationalist, if you want to do something about global warming, it would be a great thing if China built thorium-based reactors instead of coal plants. These guys are probably going to pull it off. And, you know, good. I hope they do. The last operational molten salt reactor shut down in the United States in 1969. It ran in a remote location. Research documents were kept in a walk-in closet. For three decades, we didn't even know this was an option. Then in 2002, Ornell's molten salt documentation is scanned into PDF and made accessible to some NASA employees. 2004, Kirk Sorensen delivers CD-ROMs full of molten salt research to national labs and universities. Dr. Per Peterson receives a copy. 2006, Kirk moves the scanned research onto his website. 2008, molten salt reactor lectures begin at Googleplex, hosted on Google's YouTube channel. 2009, the very first thorium conference is held. Wired Magazine runs a feature story on thorium. 2010, American Scientist runs a feature on thorium. International thorium conferences begin. Server logs show Chinese students downloading molten salt reactor PDFs from Kirk's website. 2011, China announces their intention to build a thorium molten salt reactor. In the U.S., Flybe Energy is founded. Transatomic Power is founded. 2012, Baroness Bryony Worthington tours Ornell's historic molten salt reactor experiment, which has never been made open to the public. Kun Chen visits Berkeley, California, telling us 300 Chinese are working full-time on molten salt reactors. 2013, Terrestrial Energy is founded. 2014, Thorcon is founded. Moltex is founded. Seaborg Technologies are founded. Copenhagen Atomics are founded. 2015, India reveals their new facility for molten salt preparation and purification. A flood of technical details and technology assessments are released by molten salt startups including Lifter EPRI, a collaboration between Flybe Energy and Southern Company to assess technological readiness of Flybe Energy's molten salt breeder reactor design, the Lifter. 
China announces that now 700 engineers are working on their molten salt reactor program. 2016. Peter Thiel, an investor in the molten salt startup Transatomic Power, contributes over a million dollars to Donald Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. Miriam Tonloto releases a feature-length documentary about molten salt reactors called Thorium, the Far Side of Nuclear Power. Dr. James Hansen tells Rolling Stone magazine that we should develop molten salt reactors powered by thorium. Oak Ridge discovers actual film footage of the molten salt reactor itself. Produced in 1969, it was forgotten in storage for over 45 years. It offers up our first and only glimpse of an operating molten salt reactor. 2017. To propel this new era of American energy dominance. First, we will begin to revive and expand our nuclear energy sector, which produces clean, renewable, and emissions-free energy. President Donald Trump observes nuclear power is both a renewable resource and an emissions-free source of energy. A complete review of U.S. nuclear energy policy will help us find new ways to revitalize this crucial energy resource. And I know you're very excited about that, Rick. HR 590, Advanced Nuclear Technology Development Act, is passed through the House of Representatives. Flybe Energy reveals Lifter 49, a new two-fluid reactor designed to turn thorium into life-saving medical isotopes. Just like original Lifter, it is a machine that recycles wasted material such as mine tailings, coal ash piles, and now used fuel rods into enormous amounts of energy. Back in the 60s, Alvin Weinberg saw the molten salt reactor as a means of addressing energy pollution and the need for clean water. Power centers would co-locate energy-intensive manufacturing and small modular reactors. Surplus power would be sold to nearby communities. He knew energy was the ultimate raw material. The more energy you have, the easier it is to recycle and use virgin materials more efficiently. Given enough power, we can pull carbon right out of the atmosphere or ocean. China announced their plans to develop and commercialize a thorium-fueled molten salt reactor in 2011. I'd finally like a president of the United States to know what molten salt reactors are and why they are. Every time mankind has been able to access a new source of energy, it has led to profound societal implications. Wow, uh, I guess that's telling us that the time is almost up. Well, uh, we've got about a minute left. Now, this just tells me that there are some things in the works that the rest of the world is doing that we should be taking advantage of. But it is our environmentalist movement that gives us things like the Green New Deal, which uh, prevents us from moving in the direction that we need to. Uh, I think that the environmentalists need to actually figure out what the end goal is and, and tell it publicly. And I'm not talking about going back into the uh, Neolithic Stone Age or whatever the Stone Age was, the Bronze Age, the, I the Ice Age. We don't need to go back there. What we need to know is what is the goal for the climate? Where do we want that climate to be? What are other useful things that we can be doing? I think the whole thing is misguided. I'm going to kind of try to lead this into uh, next week's show. There are other things that we can be doing. We really just need to go back. If the, if the environmentalists would just go back to ecology and managing the resources the correct way and stopping with this uh, Don Quixote windmill chasing uh, thing about you know, climate change, I think we would all, as humanity, be better off. So anyhow, for Dallas Pearson Producer, I'm your host, Jeff Williams. Thanks for watching North Star Oasis. 292 shopping days left till Christmas. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.